Hey guys, today we are talking to Debbie Potts, otherwise known as the low carb athlete. Debbie Potts, really impressive person. She's done a lot of physical activity in her life, <laughs> won a lot of races and participated in things that are quite extreme. She was also a personal trainer for over 25 years. And then in 2012, she started experiencing mystery symptoms. All of a sudden, gains 30 pounds out of nowhere, chronic fatigue starts uh, settling in, digestive issues. And she realized, okay, we got to do something else here if I'm going to get this figured out because what I'm doing right now is not working. And so she actually became what I'm sure was one of the first FDNs probably because thinking about when the course started, I'm guessing she was within the first few hundred FDNs. So we have someone who 10 years later is still doing this work out here with a very successful business um, and hopping on the podcast to share with us what she's learned. We hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Let's get to it. All right. Hey, Debbie, how are you? Welcome to the Health Detective Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on the show today. We are glad to be with you talking to yet another functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner and one who is doing quite a lot of stuff, a podcast host herself. Um, and I love the uh, the way that this uh, went or is going to go today because I like looking at the bios. I like getting just enough information about the person to be able to have an intelligent conversation, right? But the audience knows I love going in actually as ignorantly as possible, just so it's really authentic. But I saw the whole low carb thing. And that's something as uh, as a skinnier guy who was told that he should be eating like <laughs> 400 grams of carbs per day at 20 to gain weight. Um, I now know that is ridiculous and did not help my health so much. So I'm excited to go that route if uh, we end up there. But to start off, we always start with the same question on this podcast, really simple. And it's just when did your health journey start? And what symptoms were you exhibiting? Because really, no one gets into this work without having had their own health journey. <laughs> <laughs> so true that I always say that too, with my interviews with the practitioners is that we all have our own story and we're following our own passion and purpose because of our own experiences brings us down this journey as a practitioner for sure. I was um, kind of a, well, a competitive triathlete, endurance athlete, marathoner, cyclist as I first since I was like 29. I just somehow turned 50 years old last year. Somehow. And my, <laughs> somehow I still can't come to grips with that I'm 50, but I started doing triathlons and marathons when I was 28, 29 years old. And I was also in fitness industry since college doing personal training and health coaching in that space. But my life changed as I knew it in about 2013. I started to feel fatigue and couldn't sleep at night and was the best shape of my life finishing Ironman Hawaii and Ironman Canada in 2012 and doing all these races, placing in the top three. Oh, nice. And wow. suddenly three months later, I was 30 pounds heavier mm -hmm. and having naps and had no energy or strength to do anything. Mm -hmm. So 2013 was quite the turning point in my life and in my journey. I was already doing some health coaching and um, doing a lot of different continuing education in that space, but it really led me down the path to nutritional therapy and FDN and functional lab testing and really figure out, you know, the why and what was wrong with me because I could never get help myself. And, and that brought me to writing a book called Life is Not a Race is a journey yes. that it's, you know, seeing all these different practitioners and doctors and experts in fatigue and, and functional medicine and not ever getting results mm -hmm. until I kind of started going into it myself, cool. as most people say. <laughs> wow. Well, I always find it remarkable because we have people that, you know, we're in athletic fields or personal training or whatever, but that's some serious stuff you were doing, obviously. And I always find it so interesting. And I think the audience especially does considering not everyone's an FDN, right? Um, how you could be capable of doing something like that. You even said yourself the best shape of your life. And yet we're not feeling good. Like the body will adapt yeah. to what we make it do as long as it can, at least. But that doesn't mean that there's not consequences to that. And there's not major stress going on. And I, I'd love taking any opportunity I can to really just hopefully expand society's view on this because for his privacy, I'll, I'll be vague, but I have uh, someone that I know in my life that is a top level athlete. And yet this person comes to me with gut issues and mental health issues and all this stuff, but they are performing at the top of their field on like national levels. And it's like, yeah, well, you can do that sometimes and really not be in the best health. We, we need to stop equating <laughs> 
people being able to run fast or be super strong or even look good sometimes like bodybuilders with being healthy. Yeah. It is not the same thing. You know what I mean? For sure. And that's what I've said over the years is I kind of switch my focus as a health and fitness coach mm -hmm. and adding FDM practitioner work into my style of coaching, personalizing their nutrition and exercise program, what I call the holistic method. And really going, are you fit and healthy from the inside out? Because so many athletes, if you go watch an Ironman triathlon, <laughs> if you go watch a marathon, you know, people do not look lean, fit, strong, healthy. They are very few that actually look really fit and lean. And that even could be misleading as well. You might look good on the outside, but inside your total mess, as we say, metabolic chaos, and you have no idea even myself, like I was thinking I was thriving and doing the best at races and performing at a high level, but underneath all this chronic hidden internal stressors were brewing inside of me because I would say I didn't just suddenly burst yeah. March of 2013. It was like this volcano slowly erupting yeah. until suddenly there was like no more I could hold it in and it just went yeah. it exploded. And I think a lot of athletes have that going on. And I feel that that's my kind of purpose now is to help other athletes and aging athletes prevent going through what I went through. And it's not something we have to do. It's something we can control if we identify early on those big major red flags that us top high-performing, ambitious individuals can really stop, pause, sure. and go, wait, that is a red flag because we kind of think we're tough and we override those and push through yeah, it. Absolutely. And just going back to what you said about even looking good on the outside could be misleading because, I mean, the classic example of this are the pro bodybuilders that are not follow They're not natural, that's for sure, right? And, I mean, yeah. most people, not everyone, but a lot of people do consider them the pinnacle of aesthetics and, wow, these people look amazing, but yet some of them die at 40 years old. That's that's a problem, guys. You, you you could look great, but that doesn't mean that everything's going well, as obviously was the case here. And I think the other thing is, too, and I've seen this almost even, um, I'm sure you work with people like this sometimes, like the type A entrepreneurial thing. Like my generation, and I know I'm being biased because I've dealt with this myself, we see people that are working like 70, 80 hours a week, maybe in the older generation or doing this stuff, and we wonder why we can't do it. And I think the problem is this. We have a more toxic world than ever before, and our generation's growing up more toxic. So I think it's much harder for us to get away with the 80-hour weeks while also being exposed to blue light and never having really gotten a good night of sleep, right? And spending our entire lives on video games and Netflix and all this stuff. Social media just, I mean, I hate to be that guy, but like social media adding to the mix too. There's more stressors going on, so we're capping out faster than our parents or yep. especially our grandparents. Um, so I'm just curious because clearly you were into some form of health if you're able to be an athlete like that were you into any of like the natural or functional stuff or was it purely just for performance that that's where your relationship with health was i always was interested in health and even high school okay i was into nutrition and different diets back then i you know did aerobics i did track and field mm -hmm. and was just you know doing the soup diet <laughs> and then this diet so i was kind of into dieting which is not a no. good thing so I was always curious about health and nutrition back then. And then in college, I actually went to look at exercise science and then thought, oh, man, I'll do dietitian. Mm -hmm. Then I realized that was all chemistry and physics and not my area mm -hmm. of expertise. I didn't want to do that route. So I kind of went away. But I've always been curious of nutrition my whole life. So I was into health and, and exercise science, obviously, in college. And then afterwards, just got into doing endurance events and found out, you know, it was easy for me. It was comfortable. And I started, you know, doing running races and marathons, as I said, in my late twenties. Then I thought, you know, I got into cycling and I thought might as well do an Ironman. I just need to start swimming longer. And I had groups of friends to train with. And then we started doing these races, but then you get kind of get sucked down that path yeah. of Iron Man and then marathons and cycling events and then suddenly you're you're kind of doing that year round and that's your lifestyle that's your hobby. So nutrition and health was always curious part of it for athletes and how do we do that and kind of led me I remember the zone diet and all this other stuff starting to come out in the early 2000s that I 
Well, it's like into heart rate training, and early on, I discovered, oh, do I need to eat? I'm not losing any weight. Maybe I just won't eat. I taught spin class on Saturday, and then I started getting into riding bikes. I'd meet people to go for a bike ride to train for an event, and I thought, okay, I usually have a banana and a bagel and orange juice with healthy back then. <laughs> And I thought, I'm just, gonna, how am I going to burn fat if I keep eating all this food? That's healthy food. We thought was healthy. Mm -hmm. And then you hear as an athlete, you're supposed to eat 300 calories an hour. And I'm like, okay, I'm not losing any weight. That's what they say. What's going on? Wow. So then, Jeez. yeah. So I thought one day I wouldn't eat anything and I totally bonked. Mm -hmm. And then that was like 2000, 2001. And then I started getting more curious about nutrition and how do you burn fat as an athlete if you're eating every hour? So I kind of started down this path early on, didn't know about being fat adapted yeah. athlete, metabolic efficiency, started getting into that testing on people, resting metabolic rate and exercise rate in 2005. So I started early on before all this stuff had labels got on it, it, got you know, it. names for everything. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Well, we will hop to that for sure because that's super important um, to me because I'm someone who, I wasn't an athlete at the level that you were for sure, but I was always interested in fitness and went through the same transition. What I want to rewind to for just a second is you get into FDN. I'm always so curious about what did you find? Because I know many people are listening and they'll relate to exactly what you just said. I don't even, I think I'm healthy. I'm doing stuff like you were doing. I thought everything was fine and yet I'm not, but no one was able to help me. So how does FDN help? Like, what did you find there that you had not found yet previously? Well, uh, long story short, again, I wrote a book, Life is Not a Race, It is a Journey. And uh, Reed Davis <laughs> was at the time when this aha moment happened that I really wanted to do FDN but I was going through adrenal exhaustions, air quotes around that because it's APA, HPA axis dysfunction, dysregulation. And I was always curious about, you know, this lab testing, FDM work. I'd hear Reed talking to Sean Croxton on the podcast early days. And I was wanted to learn more because as I was trying to get help from 2013 on with my why? Like, why do I feel like this? Why mm -hmm. I have no energy? Why am I gaining weight? Why do I have to have naps in the afternoon? Right. Why can't I sleep at nighttime? All those typical red flags when we have hormone dysfunction and, and metabolic chaos. No one was running the right labs on me, as I know now. So if I saw like eight, nine different doctors, practitioners, experts, and I wanted to do FDN. And finally, I became an FDN practitioner a few years ago. I was owning a fitness studio for 10 years, so that kind of took all my finances and energy and stress. And part of my reason I had health issues, running my own business. Mm -hmm. So I found the labs that I got FDN were interesting. And even recently, I just did the Vibrant Wellness Wheat Zoomer, oh, nice. for example, last fall. That was like, aha <laughs> moment for my husband and I. It's like, all right, wheat not good in my body. You think you feel okay because I don't have any digestion mm -hmm. issues, but wow, that was a huge inflammatory food in my whole body. And then before that, when I ran the regular labs we do in the beginning, I had just, I thought it was so much healthier and I wasn't back to where I was. You know, it's just, it's been eight years that mm -hmm. I've been struggling to get really my, my own health back and okay. feel my best. And and part of that was releasing stress. Like I luckily closed my fitness studio in 2019, October and before our pandemic started. So that was even better to release some stress. And then I moved from Seattle to San Diego where I thrive a little bit more in sunshine and good weather, even though it's raining right now, but um, I off, changed yeah. my lifestyle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had to change my whole life to really get healthier. So one thing I always say is that, you know, doing all the lab testing is essential, but the dress that we talk about for our clients and ourselves, the Dress for Health Success protocol we give people is so essential because I can't blame those eight, nine different practitioners and doctors I saw over the years. It was me that had to change mm. my lifestyle. So I can do all the labs I want. I did that many times with a Kalish, Dr. Kalish expert, with a different practitioner, different naturopath. I've done these labs for years, but until I took ownership for my own health, made those drastic life changes, those changed the, my mindset, changed my whole day, I wasn't getting better because I didn't do as much changes as I really needed to do to thrive and get my health back again. Right. So the lab testing was essential, but 
doesn't really change if you don't change your ways of doing things. Well, I, lo- I love that so much. I hope uh, I might make that our excerpt for this podcast because I always like to highlight the best <laughs> thing. And no, seriously, because if people just took that little part that it is our responsibility, that that's what it is. And mm. I think, thankfully, by the time people get to FDN Thrive, they usually are pretty ready in that sense. Uh, but occasionally, yeah. you know, someone gets through where it's just like they're not fully ready to do this. And it's funny because they have the money. They got the time. They can do this. But they haven't gotten this right yet. The mind, I know we might mm-hmm. not be on video somewhere on audio. So the mindset is what I'm pointing to, the brain. Um, they haven't gotten that right yet. And that's – you can have the best labs or practitioners in the world and it won't really matter. Um, and I love that FDN mm-hmm. always starts with that because even myself as a graduate of several years, it's – you know, you're in the professionals group and you're seeing all this complex stuff, which sometimes is relevant in today's world. But at the end of the day, it's like we can't even start having that conversation. If this person's still going out and partying two nights a week and getting bombed till two or three in the morning, what are we talking about gut bugs and food sensitivities for, right? I, I can tell yeah. you your problem right now. <laughs> like we, we got to yeah. get to bed on time. That's probably the first place to start. Um, we got to stop putting a toxin in our body. And it's easy enough to get caught up in the weeds and the results and forget that, but it is really important. So I, I thank you for highlighting that. And, um, you know, how, well, you said that you've kind of been on this journey for a while now. How did FDN, though, become something that you wanted to do? Because I'm assuming this wasn't your career when you were, you know, doing these races, or originally at least. Like, what, what inspired you to really make this your career? Well, I've always been fitness personal sure. trainer okay. for since out of college and I ran fitness centers in college. I ran a health fitness director for clubs. And so I've been in the industry, but not testing. And I found as a personal trainer, I really was evolving. You know, I did the Paul checks program, holistic lifestyle coach. I did nutritional therapy practitioner. I really felt like there's, I couldn't help people totally because it is nutrition, eating real food and our lifestyle habits and how to train correctly not too much, not too little, the right amount called the Goldilocks effect for everything. But the lab testing was such an important part of my journey to become the best practitioner, best health and fitness coach that I needed to be able to run labs on people and, you know, not go to medical school or become a naturopath, but I wanted a, a program I could be able to assess labs and that's why I love our medical director program because we I go through labs with experts in there because I can't be expert in everything. Sure. I know a little bit about a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so I like to have that, you know, let's go through and make sure I'm seeing everything that we can see to help this client. Mm-hmm. But the, the lab testing was a big part. So I've always done the, the lifestyle, the nutrition, and continuing to learn more about that part of it. But you know, being able to run like the organic acids test, doing a GI map and understanding how those are additional clues. And really, you know, as we say, being a health investigator as a, a detective, as we talk about here, that we're always collecting clues and those external stressors we can identify, but those internal hidden and chronic stressors we don't know about unless we test. So yeah. that saying test to not guess, I say, I think every day that really we need to collect more data and doing the lab testing is part of that investigation. Yeah. Okay, so perfect. This was just a logical extra step for you then, right? Add FDN on. Exactly. Cool. And uh, that makes sense. I feel like when I've talked to the people who were really like OG FDN's first wave, Sean Croxton era, it was a lot of personal trainers. That's who was originally coming through. And this has expanded yeah. so much now. We still have those personal trainers and we have doctors, we have acupuncturists, chiropractors. We have people like me where actually, I mean, technically I do have a certification in personal training, but I've never really used it. Um, you have people like me that this is kind of their main thing. And it's just amazing to see the diversity of this community. And it's simply because these issues don't discriminate, right? It, it, it affects mm-hmm. all of yeah. us. Um, now, again, as someone who loves the lower carb thing and truly focusing on getting fat adapted to the best of our ability in our modern world, I'd love to start talking about that in this podcast. I, FDN, it's not like we discourage that by any means, but we don't necessarily go that route on day one. So was this after FDN that you started finding out about this? Or, I mean, you referenced a pretty early date, if I'm not mistaken. Were you already yeah. doing that before? Yeah. I've had my podcast for 10 years. Wow. Talking about this. So wow. we were talking about Fit Fat Fast was the original podcast to be, when you're doing endurance sports, it's a fat burning sport. It's not carbohydrates. So teaching people how to be more metabolically efficient is what I originally was talking about. I used to do metabolic testing, as I said, in 2005 for years until the 
company got bought by uh, New Leaf Testing Cart got bought by Lifetime Fitness. So sadly, I had to stop that. But I was testing people at rest and exercise. How efficient are you at burning fat? Where do you start to burn carbohydrates? So I was always wow. interested in that. I was interested in, in fueling and I trained by heart rate. I trained my clients by heart rate when they're doing their exercise. So putting that all together into really a personalized plan to figure out, okay, what nowadays we use a CGM, you know, look at genetics, looking at their, like if you can use Aura or Whoop and using all this data we can collect along with the functional test and a vibrant wellness test or MRT, food sensitivities. And I personalize that nutrition program That's and their fueling training plan. Mm -hmm. And really look at, okay, how can you live your best life and be your best self and perform your best by making this comprehensive program just for you as a unique individual? So looking at carbohydrates as a fuel source, but more strategic carbohydrates. So they're not something that are essential, like essential amino acids, essential um, um, fatty acids, but you know, carbs and not saying, I keep saying this on my podcast, it's low carb athlete podcast, doesn't mean zero carbs. It's about real food that balances their blood sugar and where to place those carbohydrates that give you kind of that extra backup fuel tank as rocket fuel for an athlete, as well as putting them more at carb refeeds at nighttime that will help optimize your sleep because they can convert into serotonin and help to make melatonin. So really looking at placing those carbs, not crappy carbs, but real food carbs into your day and matching your nutrition and your exercise together. So it's not about zero carbs. And I hate labeling anything as keto and, you know, carnivore, right. paleo, everything is labeled, but just real food that gives you energy, helps you recover, repair, helps your sleep, help you again, thrive every day. Okay. And I'm not sure what's more impressive, the fact that you were focusing on fat adaption back then or the fact that you've had a podcast for 10 years. Because both of those, <laughs> I mean, seriously, at those times, those they're really not that talked about things. And we're still in a yeah. bubble, let's be honest. I mean, yes, people know what the keto diet is. Even my dad's heard of that. Everyone's heard of it. But they don't know what we're necessarily talking about right now where, okay, can we see on a – you know, a blood meter that you actually are getting into ketosis or something like that, right? They don't know that. So it's really mm -hmm. impressive that you were kind of doing that back then. And again, I had this interesting experience, not being a high level athlete myself, but someone into the fitness thing. The first thing I ever got into was I wanted to be like a natural bodybuilder. I thought that was kind of cool. And then I realized because I thought it was healthy. I realized even what they were doing. I'm like, we're eating like once every like two hours. Like this, this was just nuts and it wasn't working and I wasn't gaining weight properly. And now I had health issues my whole life. So the advice was to gain weight, keep adding, like hit, hit your protein, hit your fat. Oh, you're skinny, you're an ectomorph, great. Then just keep adding carbohydrates. So I got to the point, Debbie, where I'm at like 400, 500 grams of carbs per day. This is all tracked. It's on, I mean, I have the logs from it. And I'm not really gaining weight properly. My skin is terrible. I feel awful. I'm hungry all of the time. Like it's just constant, this up and down battle. And now I'm a guy who uh, literally just today, uh, uh, somewhat prior to this podcast, I'm able to go to the gym after being up for four or five hours. I don't do this every day. I'm just saying I didn't eat this morning at all. I went, I did squats, I did military press, deadlift, no problem, no changes in my energy. And I was able to eat afterwards. Again, I don't do that all the time, but just the fact that I'm able to do that and I still feel great right now, I think is a sign that, you know, the body shifted or I do track uh, my blood ketones and I can see that yeah, even after I eat a good amount of carbs in a day, I can get into this. So how do you possibly break this paradigm for so many of these athletes? Because still today, I know so many of them would look at you and me like we're crazy if we said we're going to do these really high and in highly involved um, athletic events without four or 500 grams of carbs, or without eating 300 calories every single hour. So uh, do you find that there's resistance to this mindset wise? Well, let's unpack. Yeah. So there is, you know, b the process of being fat adapted, you start with first. And I keep talking about this kind of my theme of the my show this year is to share this because it's different. The guidelines we're hearing out there for people that are promoting more nutritional ketosis for longevity, fat loss, health issues, you know, makes sense if you have, you know, metabolic chaos and if you can individualize that with looking at food sensitivities and labs yeah. and metabolic typing. But 
you know, I would say what to eat, when to eat, why you're eating and how you're eating. So we need to look at all of that because it's so individualized. So exercising is a big topic right now, fasted exercise. And when do I eat before or do I eat after? And I keep diving deep into this, into my my world, because I think a lot of us, especially the aging athlete and the female athlete, we're doing too much of everything as all <laughs> areas seem to be that you know top a high performing individual that's ambitious driven that I work with because it's similar to myself that we tend to take everything to the extreme. So too much fasting, too much prolonged fasting for an athlete. Should you eat before or should you eat after or both and when to break your fast? Because what if you're causing more damage than good? And what that looks like for you is going to be different for me because females and males are very different. So finding what minimal research there are on for the female athlete versus male is different because women obviously have menstrual cycles Mm -hmm. if they're premenopausal and you know really looking at matching their nutrition and their training with their menstrual cycles a whole other mapping out area that's really growing but the males might do better at burning fat if they do a fasted workout eat afterwards where females might if they're lean fit might do better having a little bit of calories beforehand, sure. even if it might be some, you know, something in a coffee drink or a tea. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, you know, the fast exercise is huge and doing low carb, but carb timing. And really I'm trying to teach people it's not zero carbs. <laughs> you might do better and perform better and even, you know, lose fat weight if you have a little bit more carbs. But just to finish up with what you were saying, like eating more carbs, it is finding that individual carb tolerance. As I did an amazing interview with Rob Wolf oh, nice. recently on placing your carbohydrates in. You could have two, 300 grams of carbohydrates and still be burning fat as an athlete. <laughs> and so that doesn't kick you out of nutritional ketosis and what's called metabolic flexibility that we don't necessarily need to be in nutritional ketosis 0.5 to 1.0 every day. Right. You know, it's gaining that flexibility shift back fat burning is your main fuel tank and your backup fuel tank is carbohydrates and being efficient be able to flip that switch when we need that extra fuel tank that backup engine as carbohydrates absolutely i was uh, glancing over my bookshelf because i i think i have he was one of the authors of um sacred cow correct yeah he wrote sacred cow and the paleo solution but he wrote the garb the carb um Keto, what is my book? I just I just drew a blank of his recent book. It was out about five years ago. But it was just, he's really good that, you know, athletes, especially his areas, CrossFit, that they need to have a little more carbohydrates. And then there's people that argue, you know, carnivores, zero carbs, carbs are not essential because protein can be converted into glucose via gluconeogenesis. So I'm not going to eat you know, I, having a steak or a burger patty before I go swimming is not going to be effective yeah. <laughs> for me. So being able to have easily digestible food and, you know, what to eat for athletes, I think it, it gets confusing out there for people. Absolutely. And I like that you mentioned the individualized thing and even figuring out the carb tolerance because that has been the one advantage of someone like myself who, it, you know, does maintain a pretty lean physique no matter what. I just, even my dad's the same way. I don't think that's ever... I can't imagine this changing too dramatically. I, I would never be a 300 pound person. I, something would have to dramatically change. Yeah. And um, that's the thing. It's like, I like to just test sometimes, like how much can I get away with? And it was interesting because the other day I'm like lifting, I'm exercising. I ate 70, 80 grams of net carbs. And all of 14 hours later, I'm a 1.0 on my blood ketone meter. And that's like, mm-hmm. again, I mean, that's after four or five years of consistent on and off intermittent fasting. I know consistent and on and off sound funny. I just mean in the sense of, like you said, you don't want to necessarily be doing this every day. And that's what I thought in the beginning. All right, I'm going to fast 16 hours a day every single day, but then you're not necessarily accounting for, well, did I have a lot of output today? Um, Did I do a ton? Like you might need to make up for that. And even just yesterday, this is a rare occurrence for me. I like to not really eat too late at night, but it was like 7.30 and I'm hungry and I didn't eat enough today to really match my output. So it's like, 
maybe humans yeah. weren't supposed to be eating a huge meal at eight o'clock at night. Probably not, but they're also not supposed to be malnourished either. So it's like picking my thing. And I did that and I felt really good this morning, actually good enough to go to the gym four hours fasted just in the morning and lift weights, right? So I made the right choice for my body. And um, I think that's one of the coolest gifts that we give people as FDN practitioners is this gift to become their own detectives and really the education to know their bodies well enough so that one day they don't really need us. They know how to be intuitively doing things again because, but when they come to us, almost by definition, you have to be so out of sync with your body and your needs that that's why you kind of need someone like us. Um, Of course, it's a little more complex than that, but you know what I mean. Um, But that's just, I was just going to throw in the, uh, that's why I do more comprehensive coaching, like, I, not unlimited, but just full-time coaching with someone for six months. And we call it our VIP program that we work on all those elements that I call the holistic method or like similar to the dress protocol that we're working on their exercise and nutrition and movement throughout the day and their hydration and digestion. And it's happiness Mm -hmm. is a big part of it for my program that I'm really coaching people full time on their nutrition and health and lifestyle habits and individualizing it. So what is ideal day look like for you? And that's going to vary day to day. Like you just said, matching your nutrition with your exercise and teaching people kind of get through that fat adaptation process. If that's, if they're coming from a carb burning blood sugar dysregulation background, Mm -hmm. which most people are, (laughs) towards being intuitive fueling and intuitive training for me and myself working with the aging athlete and teaching them how to look at things, a different approach in our forties and up than what you did when you're 20, 30 year old, you can get, you know, get away with a lot of things, but now it's like, all right, don't blame the aging process. Worst pet peeve of mine (laughs) is don't blame the aging process. Just embrace the changes and let's approach how, we do things differently, like how we eat is going to be differently and how we train and, you know, sleep and recovery is going to be important. So really looking at that big approach and using Aura Ring, using a Whoop and other CGMs and really looking at the whole picture along with the functional lab so we can figure out the best program for you, but varying it day to day, like you said, the exercise loads are going to be different than yesterday to today. So it's always, you know, really figuring that out for someone. This podcast, I got to get us some more sponsorships. We've never really taken that route yet, but like (laughs) the aura ring, I'm so excited to try all this stuff. I just got finally sold on that. Um, the other day by someone who came on, I just think it's cool. Like I want to track that and see uh, different things with my sleep. Right. Or um, if I'm not mistaken, an aura ring also will, don't they give you kind of like your readiness score or is that a different device? No, they whoop. So I coach clients with whoop and aura and I've used aura for a year now. And it's really both give readiness. Mm -hmm. Whoop will say it as your strain. You're both going to get your heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. So those are choosing between aura. It's a ring, which you can't see in the video or the whoop band. I didn't want because it's on your wrist and I hate things on my wrist. So I'm not going to sleep with that. So it depends on what you like. I have some clients that have the whoop because they hate wearing a ring. So (laughs) It depends what you like and what will you keep. But it is really biohacking, so to speak, of what works for you because it is an N equals one experiment in this ongoing journey. And you'll learn like Super Bowl Sunday, I couldn't, I was up, I didn't put my blue blockers on watching the game. We taped the game, I put it on later because we were outside, you know, doing yard work and stuff. So I didn't want to watch the game. It was 3 30 here, as an example. And I ate dinner. Like at six, it was later because we were outside doing stuff. Well, my sleep score, deep sleep, was in the garbage. I mean, I'm usually like 20, 30%. It was like three, 5% that night (laughs) because I cannot eat. And I usually just weekdays eat two o'clock, three o'clock is my main meal. Mm -hmm. I cannot eat before bed. Mm -hmm. Two, three hours is like worse deep sleep. So you really learn how to take all this info we coach people on and really figure out what works for you. What is your body saying so having different metrics so we can test and not guess Mm -hmm. what works best for you we don't know unless we 
have that data. I love that you mentioned that because you know I kind of had already uh, alluded to it in a sense, but it, you said it better. Where you no, know, a lot of people really don't do too great on that whole eating late thing, and it, it, some of this is common sense. You'd think, like guys, at one point, and even there are still some indigenous tribes out there. It's far and few between, but they exist. It's just how on earth do you guys think that it was like pitch black dark, and now the whole tribe's getting this huge meal and everyone's chilling out and like eating like an hour right before bed. It's just I, I don't feel like that would have been realistic. I think it would have made a ton of sense that they would have utilized daylight to take down, you know, potential meal or something like that. And then, or um, yeah. what do you call that? Like gather certain things from the woods or whatever. I, I can't imagine we were doing that at like 9 p.m. in pitch black uh, darkness. I, I don't think that would have been the human being way. So, so much of it's common sense. And then you get to this next level of almost just knowing it intuitively. I've never used some of these things that track my, track my sleep. I can tell you for a fact that I'm like you where I just do not do well uh, eating right before bed. And especially, I think most people know this with like the example of like a steak, right? We all know that if we ate a steak at like 8.39 and we go to bed at 10, uh, we're sleeping like not so great that night. But it does apply on a more smaller scale with other things. And that's why I've been interested in this more objective data. Like I really wanna know how these little changes that I do um, do affect the sleep so i appreciate you bringing that up now i always like to um i like to give some time for people to really talk about client successes especially someone like yourself who's been doing this um i mean you've been taking clients in this for for a long time especially compared to most fdn so i'd love to know like what are some of your top client success stories that come to mind to the ability that you're able to share them for privacy reasons but we really we're able to do some amazing work as fdn so i'm curious if anything comes to mind yeah i think right away is working more with my new, you know, I've done the coaching packages with people that you meet once, twice a month. But what I find the biggest success with is, and what I'm focusing on more in my coaching program for clientele is, is a six months program that it's, you know, we talk every day, we use Voxer, wow. they can reach out to me, we, they don't have to talk to me every day, but they can <laughs> reach out to me. And we have weekly calls, but I'm, I'm watching their CGM. I'm watching their WHOOP or an AURA score. So I'm collecting their data. We're doing the lab testing every, you know, four or six months, depending on the person's budget and what they're working on. And we're always course correcting. So it's having this one-on-one, -on -one, you know, journey together that I'm along the road with them to get them started. And then some of them go longer, but it, it is you know, working on all the nutrition and health and lifestyle, their exercise program mm -hmm. as well, and and doing all this comprehensive approach. So I find, you know, having that connection with people, oh, they're going out of town or, you know, they have a trip coming up or they have a, a meeting mm -hmm. and we can identify, you know, what we need to tweak and adjust based on having this longer journey together sure. rather than just talking to them once a month. I just didn't feel like I was making as much impact and mm. in helping inspire people to change. And I, I know my own journey, you know, I was always looking for someone to help me, not just like, you know, go over what supplements you should take. But as I said, I didn't really start to get healthy until I, I changed my way of life. I changed my, my work. Sure. You know, I went from owning a personal training studio, running everything, teaching classes, doing infrared sauna treatment for nutritional therapy, all of that. I did everything. And that was my, a big part of my stress. So changing that to just doing FDN work full time, but taking my whole, you know, 25 years of experience in health and fitness and then combining it with FDN practitioner work to now do a personalized, the holistic method, I call it coaching program to help the aging athlete and others that just want to feel their best mm -hmm. and just think, you know, I can't get any help and be that person like, okay, let's go in and dive yeah. in a little deeper and change and create these new positive habits that you can carry on with. Okay. So yeah, sorry. I, because I know going back to the question though, like, is there specific examples of like maybe like a client testimonial or something where someone comes to you and you know, it's kind of at the end of their rope and we're able to be the ones as an FDN that kind of really helps them turn it around. I guess identifying, I know I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> True. So I was thinking of my client that I've been helping with the past year and just uh, I, revealing these hidden internal stressors. So example, I just retested someone's labs. So I'll be specific. He wasn't losing he's doing all the right things like the exercise nutrition i've been working with him for a year but we finally did 
some other labs like the Vibrant Wellness Zoomers, the Dutch test, did more comprehensive blood panel, waiting for his GI test to come back, and really finding it was wheat. It was easy, like putting the foods that he was eating every day that were healthy were not healthy for him. And they're causing, you know, putting gasoline on the fire. So you couldn't figure out I'm doing all the right things, but why am I not losing weight? Why am I still fatty fit and have this layer of fat over the muscle? Because he's been working out, doing all the lifestyle habits, doing the hot, cold showers, doing everything we talk about. But until we were able to go, okay, you are highly reactive to wheat. And that's why I feel like everyone should run the wheat zoomer and, you know, eggs. He's having eggs every day for lunch with a cassava flour tortilla. Mm -hmm. What was on there? Cassava flour. What was on there? Stevia. Every amino acid and other drink mixes that he's taking pre-workout, low, post, stevia. Yeah. What else was on his test for food sensitivities was turmeric. So finally, you know, we started looking at it all and taking those out. Even yesterday we met and he already lost five pounds. Wow. Because wow. he was having all this constant inflammation in his body and it's causing his cortisol levels causing additional stress there and his thyroid his reverse thyroid was elevated so obviously his, his metabolism and being able to burn fat was compromised wow so that was just one example just how much wheat <laughs> it's just amazing you think you feel fine but you see it on a lab test you're like ugh, that chronic inflammation could be just Part of what we're putting in our body that we think is so healthy, good foods for us. Sure. Well, that's the kind of stuff I love to hear, right? Because there's so many people that just, it, they wouldn't necessarily think, unfortunately, to look any deeper, right? But as FDNs, we don't give up. We know that the body's supposed to be healthy. And so we keep yeah. looking for other stuff and trying to find it. And uh, we had, of course, you know her, Whitney Morgan, on uh, probably like episode four or five way back. And she is like the gluten queen. And it was so interesting because she shared a story about someone who was working with her. And you know, they had removed all gluten in every single way. But Debbie, the damn person next door, the business next door, I should say, was a bakery. It was going <laughs> through the vents to the office <sighs> and the inhalation of this was causing um, the sensitivity for the person and the reaction. And when they got out of that office, their health symptoms started getting a lot better. Now, um, for those out there listening, it's not like we want to create an extreme state of paranoia, right? Like, oh my gosh, like I can't even do something like that. But listen, if you're unhealthy and you're doing everything that you can, sometimes we got to make some sacrifices and really figure this stuff out or or see the importance of it. Um, and generally speaking, and I might be at an advantage because I'm, I'm younger than all a decent amount of FDNs. I know the trend's kind of shifting with that. Um, and now we have, I mean, we have people from 20 all the way up to 70. It's kind of interesting. But the point is, I feel like I was able to bounce back from the wheat thing pretty easily. Like, I, I feel like I don't have to be as safe. I'm not ever intentionally consuming wheat, but I'm sure I've accidentally got hit with it. And I don't seem to notice anything or nothing seems to really happen. But my mom, for example, she had her thyroid removed from Graves' disease <laughs> uh, several years back before we ever knew about the FDN stuff, unfortunately. And she's still actively working in a restaurant she used to own. Um, she's kind of finishing up there, helping the new owner. And my mom's strict with her gluten removal. But I'm now knowing that story with Whitney Morgan, I'm still thinking, I'm like, it's just like you said, you think you feel good. I'm like, my mom could probably feel so much better. She has to be getting exposed to this stuff. It's not like it's even an organic restaurant. I mean, this is a classic normal cafe, right? They don't care about no cross-contamination or anything like that. So I'm thinking if a bakery could do that through the vents of an office that's next door, what happens yeah. when you're running in and out of the kitchen where people are cooking pancakes and bagels and all this stuff because it's a cafe slash diner? Yeah, I mean, people need to know about this stuff if they really want to get to the next level of health. For sure. My client has just given an example of he's been living at his parents' house while he's building a house mm -hmm. in a different city. A different city and they, I go, what do your parents eat? <laughs> you know, because he's been eating gluten-free yeah. all year. But it's still in the same kitchen that people are having flour foods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's tough. You have to take some gluten guardian or some enzymes to help help that until you can be in a your own house with a safe kitchen. But it is something to look at. But I also find, I must add, is how to explain to people. Because I know, you know, I was talking to Whitney about this. How do you say I can't have wheat or I can't have gluten? People don't get it. So I just was talking to my client yesterday. Just, you know, my husband gets migraines. So he's just going to say, I can't have wheat because it gives me migraines. Or, you know, it's hard to explain to people why you need to be gluten-free without people saying, oh, well, do you have celiacs? Yeah. Well, then it's no big deal. 
So saying, I just said, it causes infl inflammation in my body. <laughs> or, you know, he found it just easier to say, I have migraines if I have it. <laughs> but just figure out how to get out of it. Like Whitney says, just, you know, say you have celiacs if you go to a restaurant. But, you know, I'm just, if you just say that, because it's, it's in everywhere you eat out. And I scare, I get like my head hurts, like a headache. And I'm just like, okay, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, that freaks me out. Like, okay, if my head hurts right away from something, that gut brain connection is pretty scary to me. <laughs> so it's more incentives. Like I don't want to have brain fog memory issues. And suddenly, you know, 20 years from now, I don't have any memory. Yeah. So I think, you know, learning these, identifying these internal hidden stresses early on is really essential to our health and looking at, as I always say, looking at your future self, how do I want to perform and live my life 20, 30 years from now, I need to take ownership of my health now. And I wouldn't have known all this unless I ran the lab test because you think you're doing all the right things, sure. but you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I want to finish up here with a, a few quick things. One's just a question I've been thinking about a lot of this time. You're obviously someone who's been in this low carb arena for quite some time, uh, even before other people. Yeah, I mean, certainly mainstream really even started talking about this. And I hate to, to give you a question that seems like such a blanket statement, but I think you'll get what I mean here. Do you believe everyone should be fat adapted? Should everyone, regardless, uh, regardless of athlete status, Look, should anyone be eating three, four hundred grams of carbs per day? Or do you think there is a time and place for that, maybe based on where they live or, or something along those lines? Well, I always look at genetics, mm -hmm. look at your ancestors, you know, look at metabolic typing. But I don't, you want to obviously, I feel like we should be burning fat. That's mm -hmm. ancestral health. We should be fat burners. And that should be your main energy source. We have, say, 40,000 calories of stored fat versus 2,000 calories of stored carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So to get off that blood sugar roller coaster, we should be burning fat. Now, That's athletes it. that are active, training high levels, they can still tolerate, I posted a research study the other day on ultra runners, they could eat 300 to 400 grams of carbohydrates and still show ketones. So mm -hmm. I find it, the question more so is, do we need to be a nutritional ketosis 24 seven? And what the word is I keep hearing on podcasts and sharing this on my own show is that everything is variation, variability, flexibility. It's never the same thing all the time. You shouldn't eat the same foods every day. We shouldn't do the same workout program every day. Your fasting window should change every week, whatever your high carb refeed day maybe it's every sunday you know you get your kick yourself out of ketosis and the goal should be metabolic flexibility that we still are able to switch back and forth so if you stay in nutritional ketosis all the time does that hinder your ability to shift back to burning carbohydrates because we want to have that flexibility so varying everything i think would be the key but to answer your question some people can tolerate that goes back to the carb tolerance that we've talked a lot about my show for athletes it's going to be so different what how many carbs you can tolerate versus someone that's metabolically damaged sure. and not exercising like we're doing two, three-hour workouts a day, working out two, three times a day. I can still burn and consume 100, 300 grams of carbs versus someone else is giving guidelines like 50 grams total day. Dr. Eric Westman says, you know, 20 grams he starts his people on of total carbs. Not He doesn't believe in net carbs. So, sure. you know, that's extremely low. But if... That's what my goal is. I feel like my purpose to share, here's this information we hear out there from metabolic health, but what if you are an athlete? Mm -hmm. What if you are an aging athlete, a female athlete? Those numbers are going to be way different. I, I will give it to him on the uh, kind of, I don't want to open a can of worms, but I will give it to him on the net carbs thing because I cannot, I don't understand this because in theory it shouldn't be digestible, so you shouldn't be able to get the carbs from it. But I have seen some people, uh, it seems like when they eat, you know, they're not eating net. They're just eating in general. It does seem like it doesn't work for them. But for me, it's always seemed to work fine. Um, I haven't figured that one out yet. I don't know if it's just because, like, let's be honest, if we're having the conversation of net carbs versus actual carbs, chances are they're still eating some kind of like packaged food. It's probably different carbohydrates than like just vegetables, right? We don't know the net carbs of like a carrot. So uh, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're thinking this still in the context of a processed food to some degree, even if it's organic or whatever, it's still probably coming in a package that has that label to make the net carbs. So maybe that's it. Um, okay. With that said, to wrap up, I have two more things. One is the obvious one. Where can people find you? Because you have a lot to offer. And I know we've talked about a few of those things. So, um, and we'll have it all in the show notes, but please recap the main stuff, book, podcast, website, whatever. Everything's on the website, okay. debbiepots.net. 
Perfect. So you can find nice the easy. links to my podcast, blog. I have a bunch of free eBooks I put together over the last few years and service coaching services on there. Cool. Everything. DebbiePots.net. Nice and easy. All right. So the final thing for you then is the signature question we have on the Health Detective Podcast. And I always um, have to preface this with FDNs because we believe obviously in bio-individuality and we know yes. things could be different for everyone. So generally speaking... If we were able to give Debbie, in this case, a magic wand, and you could get every single person in this world to do one thing for their health, whether that's literally do one thing or stop doing one thing, what is the one thing that you would get them to do? The first thing that popped in my head, I have to say, is wake up and get outside. Get out in nature, grounding, sunrise, see the sun, start your day that way. Get outside.